I think quite a few people here already. The presentation has two parts. One part is on foot rot, which is the northern tier foot problem. And the other part is on blisters, which is typically your backpacking film on problem. We have a quick poll. Um, if Eve, you'd like to start that. Um, if you could just fill this out, which one you're most interested in. Um, I want to spend the time on what you are interested in. Okay. 13 of 14. Um, okay, and Eve and I are not voting. So that I think is everyone. And we have 16 people actually, so 14. Somebody hasn't put in, but I think if you're ready to stop, we can stop. Okay. Um, um, let's see, our poll is showing that basically half of you want to see both. Um, half of you, well, 46% 4%, want to hear blisters and only 8% foot rot. So blisters are more important than foot rot. I will go through foot rot a little bit more quickly, uh, but I will still cover the topic. Let me share the results. And um, so you can see where we are. I will stop sharing there. Okay, good. Okay. So let me share my screen um, and show you my, my slideshow. Yeah, can everyone see this? Okay, so this is, you know, the topics we're going to cover. Um, the pictures, the scouts love them because they're totally gory. You will definitely get their attention if you show these slides to your scouts. Okay, so as I said, this is the presentation is in Dropbox. Um, so feel free to take it, edit it, and use it with your units. Please, my email address is here, Karen at KidSource. If you have any problem with downloading it, let me know and I'll email it to you. Or if you have any questions at any point in time, please feel free to write me. Okay, so really I am aiming this for Trek leaders who are going on high adventure trips. Um, this is not um, beginners, like the first time you've ever had a blister in your life kind of presentation. Um, this is the chronic problems that you get when you are really pushing things really hard. But before I go too far, I have to give a caveat. Um, someone mute. Let me try and get done. We need to get mute. Hold on. Okay. One second. More people are coming in too. Okay, we'll wait a minute. Oh, okay. Um, first of all, I am not a medical professional. I am trained as a first responder. I am trained, you know, I've taken all the wilderness first aid. Anything I'm going to say here, I will not contradict a medical professional. Um, I'm just going to share my experiences and what I have learned on quite a few two treks to Philmont to Northern Tier and 50 milers. And last fall, I hiked across England on the coast to coast trail. And I have had lots of blisters. So this is definitely from me and my older son had foot rot. So that is how I know about this. Um, I want to share my experiences so that you don't have to go through it. And I want to be able to give you the information and the tools and the resources so that you can work with others in your unit. First and foremost, this book is totally awesome. Um, there's a later edition than what I show here. Um, I have my copy here. I don't know if you can see me in the little window. Um, when you look in your scouting book, the scouting book is wonderful for basic care for blisters, um, but you quickly surpass that. If you have chronic problems or you have plantar fasciitis, or a wide variety of other chronic foot problems, I highly recommend this book. 
So for those of you who want to do Northern Tier, I will go through this part. Um, my, son, my younger son put together a presentation about foot rot because his older brother got it. And he was very proud to be able to say his older brother got into trouble and what should have been done. Um, so this is what foot rot looks like at Northern Tier. Um, this is not a scout. Um, I didn't have a camera when my son got the photo or got the foot rot, but this is what his feet looked like. Um, looking at it, the thing that you need to look at is that it is not a blister. Um, it is basically decaying skin, very red, very painful. And what happened was we had returned from our great trip on, you know, we had done the Boundary Waters. We're hiking back in through camp and this man walks up to my son and says, son, come with me, you have foot rot. And I was like, what? What is going on? My son, well, not only I'm the leader, right? I'm the trek leader. And my son is, you know, and the, the medic could tell how the way Bill was walking. It had developed probably in about 36 hours my son was not going to tell anyone that he was in great pain and he was hobbling in. And we were so excited about just being back that none of us noticed. So clue one, you know, when you are on a water trip, make sure that, you know, you are paying attention to such things because your scouts may not tell you. This is the cause of foot rot. Your feet are always in the water. Um, that's my older son on the left who got foot rot, and there's my younger son on the right. All of these people are adults now, um, but your feet are chronically wet, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, foot rot is also has other names. You may have heard it, just jungle rot, trench foot, immersion foot problems. They're all in the same category. Yeah, about how that affects, you know, the wildlife and, and the atmosphere and people's uh, okay, um, it's not the same as athlete's foot. So you can read more in the URL that I have here. Um, what happens is the foot tissue basically starts to change color. It gets wrinkled, you know, when you, your limbs have been in the water for too long, but the skin and tissue begins to die, becomes infected, it becomes itchy, it becomes painful and it can fall off. Um, the first thing are good boots that prevent it. By good boots, I mean something where the water can drain out. Your feet will still stay wet, but they're not sitting in puddles of water. Clearly, you don't wear sneakers and water shoes when you're porting um, something like this canoe because you don't have enough ankle support, but you need boots where the water can flow through. Um, these are your typical boot options. Um, the two on the left, you know, you look at the price range, the boots are like good hiking boots, they're expensive. The jungle boots on the right, uh, people in my crew cut holes into them for water flow, much less expensive. But honestly, I didn't have to buy anything else for Northern Tier. I had my sleeping bag, I had my swim bottoms, I didn't need to buy much. So buying my sons and myself a pair of boots was really our only investment. There are other brands besides these. I just wanna give you some idea. Um, I personally have the Chodas. Um, other people have you know, the other ones, but these boots, what they do is they give you the ankle support that you need for the portages, but there's enough mesh where the water flows out much more so than running shoes. So you start with something like this. The next big thing is every day when you get to camp, you gotta dry your feet. Um, take off your wet boots. We powdered our feet. We put on camp shoes and we let them air dry and we would not sleep with socks on. That, this is the key to preventing foot rot. This one slide, nothing, nothing more, nothing fancy, right? Just dry your feet out. Um, we use gold bond powder. You could use baby powder. Um, gold bonds, you know, clearly that worked well. Um, on the first trip, we did one big bottle that we passed around that didn't work because it took a long time. 
The second trip, we got the little travel containers from CVS. Everybody had them and we did it quickly. So you put it in your feet, you rub it around, and then you put on your water shoes, something like this, and your feet dry. That's all you need to do. And I think what, we, what happened was we did it really well for the first you know, two thirds of the trip. And then it was like, oh, we're not having any problems. And I think everybody slacked off. Okay. So let me just pause here for a moment. Um, I wanna just check, is the pace of this presentation right? Am I going too fast, too slow, just right? Why don't you just like give thumbs up and Eve can take a look just to give me some feedback since I can't see you to know if I'm going at the right pace. I'm getting everybody so far is thumbs up. Somebody did ask a question if this is the same as trench foot and I think you said it is. Yes, yes it is. Yeah, and then tips for drying out boots is a question too. Oh, you can't, there's no hope. Um, your boots because um, you know what you would do is you would get into camp at five or six o'clock at night, take off your boots. I would open up the laces so that they were as open as possible and I would leave them out. But by that time the sun was down um, and we're just have you know, you can't put them over any kind of campfire. Um, some people wore socks in their boots um, that your socks are still gonna get wet, but at least you're not rubbing against, you know, um, your raw skin against the leather on the inside. Um, but no, your boots never dry out. Okay, so how did they, the doc, the medic treat it? They soaked his feet in a strong chlorine foot bath for 30 minutes. That is really, that was really painful. Um, so on my next trip, I carried a small bottle of bleach in my first aid kit with, with the expectation that if um, we had it, I would basically put the foot into the cooking pot or a plastic bag to soak it, right? He, the medic used a bucket. Um, then you keep it warm and dry. Then you treat the skin for any other conditions, whether you do have sores and you need to bandage them or you have blisters. Um, frostbite, northern tier in the winter, that could happen. I will let you know next year, I'm going dog sledding in Northern Tier in February. And hopefully I will not get my feet wet. <laughs> It'll probably be 30 degrees below zero. Um, but mostly it would be looking for sores where you would need to bandage them um, because of the pain. Okay. So the summary, the key points are that it develops very quickly. Um, so it can surprise you. I think the thing is to talk to your scouts before you leave about this so that as soon as they start to feel something, they tell you so that you can deal with it right away before it becomes a problem. You can easily confirm it visually. There's no YPT issues by looking at the scouts feet. And once you train the scouts about, about it, and you provide the foot powder and you, I would, you know, as we were putting away, you know, our canoes were put away, we had our water, I would go around and have every scout, you know, basically it's time to work on your feet. Um, and once you prevent it, it's actually a very rare problem of all the crews in my units. Um, my son was the only one who had it. Okay. So let me pause there. Um, and say, do you have any questions, more questions about foot rot? I don't any see any questions coming from or any hands up. Anybody have hands up? Okay. Um, well, let's just wait. At the end of this, we will have time and I will stay as late as you have questions. So if you think of something later, there'll be plenty of opportunities to ask. Okay, now on to blisters. Um, I am talking about chronic blister problems on backpacking trips. This is my son when we were doing the Ohlone Wilderness. I was a 30 mile 
three-day backpacking trip. He's a little bit, he's much taller now. Um, we want, the really what I'm covering is what's different about blisters on a long trek. Um, the causes of them, how do you treat them that's different? What's in my blister kits? And I've got a really gross and useful case study at the end. Um, first of all, continue to treat your scout or teach your scouts the basic blister care that's in the scouting handbook. Don't, don't change that. That works fine. That covers all of your you know, day hike blisters, your normal blisters, there's no reason to change that, that, that works. It's just when you're now going on a, say 30 mile plus hike, 50 miles or Philmont for 11 days that you need to be aware of something different. Really, the thing is with blisters, this last bullet point, before you go out, you need to do some long multi-day prep hikes. It really, not only does it build um, you know, troop cohesion and um, helping your patrol get to get know each other, it really tests the feet and the gear, uh, the, um, the gear. You can only figure this out by doing it. And what's on the right is uh, the case study when this scout had an entire foot was a blister and he didn't tell anybody and how do we treat it? This was at Desolation Wilderness. First of all, what is different about a six to 11 day trek? First of all, the big thing is your feet never get a chance to heal. You, you, know, you start to damage them, they're in a uh, different environment and you pound them day after day for 11 days. So they never heal. And so the problems just accumulate. You're, and we'll talk a lot about socks your socks never get clean and dirty socks. I'm not talking about smelly socks. I don't care how bad your socks smell. That's not my worry, but we'll talk about how they become so abrasive that they sand away your foot. The other thing is moisture. Um, if Philmont on our first trek, it rained nine out of 11 days. My feet never got a chance to dry. Um, and that caused a lot of problems. The other thing to realize is a heavy pack that you carry for a long time changes the shape of your foot. If you think about it, if you can see me in the little window, if your foot is like, you know, like let's say like this, right? Curved, and this is the, you know, my arch. When I put a heavy load on it, my foot flattens just a little bit. That causes different pressure points in your boot that then causes different blisters. So when you've got a really heavy pack, I don't care if your boots are broken in, your foot is now rubbing different places in your boot. So that's why you need to test. Um, damp feet. Soft feet deteriorate very quickly. Think about it when your feet um, are soaking wet and you can just feel how soft they are. If they're wet due to stream crossings, or wet due to excessive perspiration, it's the same thing. They're soaking wet. Um, the first thing is, you know, if you can change your socks regularly, that makes a huge difference. So my first helpful hint is, if you are prone to blisters like I am, I like for Philmont, I carried what six or seven pairs of socks. I changed them at lunchtime. I hung them from the my back of my pack to dry. Um, you know, if my pack was too heavy, I left out shirts. I only had one shirt on one of the Philmont trips because I really wanted to put all the weight into socks. But think about that. We'll talk more about socks. Breathable camp shoes without socks. It gives your chance, your feet a chance to dry. Um, you know, very lightweight shoes. Um, and then giving your feet a chance to dry at night. Don't wear socks to bed. I mean, yeah, your feet are cold, but air drying them outside of your sleeping bag are good. Tough feet are good feet, soft feet are blister prone. We have a question. Sure. Philmont, would you recommend waterproof Merrill boots or not? Oh, no, no. 
for two reasons. One is when you have to do a stream crossing and it's up to your knees, waterproof boots don't do a thing, right? It's only, waterproof boots are only good if you've got very shallow puddles and your boots are splashed. But if, you know, we had to cross, we were crossing streams every day and almost all of them were above my boots. The second thing for me was that the waterproof boots, I did have a nice pair of Merrill waterproof boots. They were so hot that my feet sweated even more. So even the days I wasn't crossing streams, my feet were soaking wet. So I got a pair of lighter weight boots um, that, yes, I got water in them during stream crossings, but my feet overall were drier. Um, but I would say a lot of it just depends on where you're hiking and what fits your foot best. And did you use a water shoe for water crossing? No, we never, I mean, often we were following a stream up so there wasn't time to take everybody stop, put on their water shoes, cross, and change your boots again. So you just wore your boots in the water? Mm hmm Okay. And also the boots give you the best support in the water. You really need something firm on your feet with good traction. And you know, water shoes typically don't give you the ankle support. So we'd be more prone to fall if we wore water shoes. Now, we did not cross any raging streams, you know, like some of the people who've done, done emigrant, where you have to put up a line and have your pack go across on the line because it's raging. Most of these were up to our knees, um, you know, moving fast enough that we had to be careful. And then do you bring water, uh, foot powder also on these? Um, to yes, you yes, I, have, I certainly have that. Um, my feet, it would certainly help with that. Um, mostly if I changed my socks more frequently, that was the, the bigger benefit here than at Northern Tier. Okay, um, blister care summary. We'll talk about how to do this. Okay, this is your standard sign, a hot spot, a sign of an impending blister. Um, we all know what it is. We all need to treat it right away. Um, at Philmont, they would tell us to put duct tape on our feet. Duct tape doesn't stick to my feet very well, believe it or not. Um, I will show, tell you about, let's see, next care, this tape. This is a wonderful tape. Um, you can buy it at CVS. Target and other places. It actually, um, it's kind of a padded tape. It's stretchy. It's stretchy. I can tear it with nicely with my finger. It sticks really well. I immediately put this on my blisters. Do you like that better than moleskin? Oh yeah, this sticks. Moleskin doesn't stick. Um, now, if you like moleskin, I would use this around the corners of the moleskin to hold the moleskin in place. And what I often do, like in when I'm running, I take this tape and put it onto a Q-tip. I've got about a foot and a half here. And then I can put this into my little fanny pack and I have it in case I need it. Um, so this works really well. But the thing is on a long trip, what you want to start to do is start to look at what is the cause of the hot spot, Because you know that you've got a long-term problem here. Is there a seam in the sock? Is the sock bunched up? Did you get dirt in the boot? Um, so it's really taking, not only putting on something on the scout's foot or your foot, but trying to figure out what is the source of the irritant. Because if you know that if you got a um, a pending blister right away, you know, is it something that you can easily treat or prevent getting worse? Or, um, or do you just cover it up and hope it goes away, which is always not a good plan, but look for these things. Um, stones and dirts in the scouts boots are pretty common. Um, they tend not to tie their boots tight. Um, 
and they get dirt in from the top, it works around, they don't clean their socks. And so you've got a lot of dirt. Somebody um, asked about leukotape. Yes, that I have that coming up on a slide. Okay. That is certainly another one. There is leukotape and KT tape. Yes, I have a, a slide coming up that looks about all the tapes. Um, this one I use large because this is so readily available at my CVS um, that, and it's worked so well for me that I use it, but I would definitely say try different products to see what you like best. Um, the other thing, the moleskin one, the rangers, I had several rangers work on my feet for an hour. I had such blisters. Mole skin, they said it doesn't really stay in place long enough. Um, there are now many other products. Um, there's Spenco's second product, um, which when we get to that slide, I will stop the presentation for a moment and show you the samples that I have. There are many other products that are now available that you put on top of blisters. Second skin, new skin, liquid bandage that I will show you. Um, these each have their pros and cons. Um, so you need to see which one works. Um, if you can clean your foot with some alcohol wipes before putting tape on, um, especially if you are gonna put powder or lubricant on later, but cleaning your feet with an alcohol wipe, if you have that in your first aid kit, is real help. So here um, are the, the, basic, um, the basic options with the pros and cons and the cost. Um, clearly, we always have duct tape. That's always there. It's relatively expensive or inexpensive. The next care tape is also fairly inexpensive. If you've got a crew at 12, the other options like the second skin adhesive and the blister kit start getting real expensive. Like each patch is like maybe 75 cents to a dollar. So you could, you know, you easily can spend a lot um, on that, which I'll show you. And clearly moleskin is very inexpensive. And this is the one where you, someone had asked about um, other foot taping options. Um, fixing your feet ran a survey. Now, granted, it's now two years old, um, but you can certainly look at the pros and cons of it. Uh, my neighbor, who's an ultra marathoner, uses the KT tape. He likes that. Um, and you can kind of see in terms of, you know, the trade-offs between how well it sticks to your skin, as well as um, how well you can get it off your skin when need be. Um, this is the one that I just told you about. Um, this one does not stand up to showers, um, but it's inexpensive enough that I certainly, well, also I didn't take many showers at Philmont. I think I got, like for a week of 11 days, I think I got two showers. Um, but when we hiked across England and I got um, a lot of blisters and I was taking, I was able to take showers every day, I just replaced this every day. Um, and because we weren't, at that trip, we actually had our gear portaged from hotel to hotel while we hiked. Uh, um, so I could carry a lot of extra uh, blister supplies that I wouldn't carry on Philmont. That this is not something to put on an opened wound. If you have a broken blister, you're going to want to put a bandage on it, maybe a gauze pad or a bandage, and then put this. This would only go on unbroken skin, such as with a hot spot. Okay, what do you do once you have a blister? Um, first of all, you know, you clean it, you look at it. If the blister has already if you have the dome on the blister, then you've got the tough decision about what do you do with the bubble? Do you pop it or not? That is really controversial. And here is your decision tree. If you are in a really clean environment, 
and the blist and the foot is going to stay clean and you can apply the appropriate mole skin um, so that it is, there's a surrounding donut around it, then don't pop it. If you are going to be in a very, if it's going to pop in an environment where it's going to get in dirty right away and you won't be able to um, treat it right away, then you're going to want to pop it. Meaning if you're doing a big climb and you know it's going to be really, you know, your feet are going to get dirty and you're not going to be able to spend 20 minutes stopping to work on your feet, then you may wish to do it in advance. Um, but this is not something you would recommend. You would tell the scouts to do, um, but you can read in the Fixing Your Feet book, the pros and cons of, you know, puncturing your blister. Um, at Philmont, they certainly, they punctured some of my blisters and they showed me how to do it, which I will talk about. Um, it is, again, this is like wilderness first aid. What you do, you know, 11 days in the wilderness is different than what you do overnight when you're at Castle Rock. The blister pads. Okay, we'll talk about this, then I'll stop the sharing for a moment and show you things. These are some new products that um, have real potential. Um, these, the blister pads, what they are, and you can, let's, they basically go over your blister, seal the whole circle around it really well, give you some padding and stop it from getting worse. New skin, is when you have an open wound and you put some of the liquid bandage on it and it forms um, skin. Okay, so here are the pros and cons. I got blisters on my heels on the first day when we were on the you know, Western side of England. And it was like, crap, first day, I'm already having problems. I put new skin on one of the blisters. It had broken while I was walking, it was raw and red. It burned beyond belief. It was really painful. Um, but as an adult, I was like, okay, I can deal with this. I, you know, I would be very hesitant about putting it on a scout just because it hurts so much. Um, an older scout who was aware of the consequences would be fine. But it certainly that sealed it really well. It worked. Um, the bottle is very tiny. Now the blister pads up here, I put it on the other one. And those are supposed to last for five to seven days without falling off. And it fell off that night and it got all white. And I was like, what's going on? You know, Cause these things are like a dollar each. I only took, brought like five of them with me on this hike. I've got a whole, you know, many days to go. And then what I did the research was, um, Blisters and wounds weep, right? When you have a cut, you'll have liquid like plasma flowing out. So it's like wet and gooey. If you have, if you put one of these blister pads on a sore that is weeping, all that fluid collects underneath, the, the pad bubbles up and then it falls off. If your blister is no longer weeping, meaning maybe it's a hot spot, or it's crusted over. When I had another one, I put one of these on and it was awesome. It didn't fall off. It protected my wound. It was great. So what I would suggest is, you know, it's the timing of it. If I have now um, a blister where, let me just, I will stop sharing for a moment so I can physically show you these. Okay. Um, can all you see me now? Okay, this is the second skin product, right? You can see the orange, the, the darker pot part in the center and the area around the outside is the adhesive. So if you, they come in different sizes, but if you've got a blister, like a, a small hot spot, and you've got a long way to go and it hasn't broken through, I'd put one of these on it immediately. And then that would protect it. If it's an open wound, meaning uh, it's raw, you know, like the red raw things that we hate. 
You can put on liquid new skin. Let's see, it comes in a little bottle like this. It's very small. Or there's even a spray on version, right? That you can spray on. But, you know, for both of these, you know, of course you wanna test things before you go, just to make sure that you're not allergic to them, right? Um, and while I have, oh, yes. And how, and, and how would you do that? <laughs> Um, I, I, I have to go hiking, get blisters. <laughs> well, I would at least spray these even on dry skin yeah. because at least I would tell you if the solvent in these is going to give you an allergic reaction. Yeah. So you at least need to do that. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Otherwise, I would probably run around in my boots with my no socks and get a blister and then put it on and see. But I would at least make sure that there is no problem with the solvent in here because that's what burns is the solvent. Um, these are, um, sometimes you can buy these in CVS, but they're readily available on um, Amazon. Um, so for these various new skin ones, there's competitors. Um, you know, this says no latex, this is another one. So if someone has a latex um, allergy, you know, you're covered with that. Um, but these are all new things that you can have. And while I've got this, before I go back to the presentation, I wanna show you a few other things I have in my first aid kit. These are toe sleeves. It's like, oh, somebody likes one, I can see that, yeah. These go slight over the top of your toe. They're soft, they're slightly padded. Um, they're a little bit too big for my pinky toes. They are, um, they just fit over my big toe. These are, they're for corns. So they're readily available in CVS. One end is open, the other end is sealed. I typically have two or three and I cut them up to fit my toes. So if, if I've got um, a problem with my toes, which we'll talk about um, toe blisters, you slip one of these over and I don't have to tape them. Um, there's another kind, which are just a piece of foam, um, like it's basically a cylinder. These are really good for my big toes. This also came from CVS. So what I'm showing is nothing here is exotic. I don't buy anything that is hard for you guys to get. Um, also, um, before, let's see. I always have a few of these nonstick pads at this size. This is the perfect size for a blister, um, a heel blister, about you know this size, nonstick, and then I put the next care tape on top. But the other thing I wanna show before I go back to the presentation is this little syringe. This is, there's no needle involved. I got this from um, a first aid kit that I bought. This, I'll show you why this was very good for wound irrigation. If this is sanitized, use once. But I carry this and I'll show you in the case study why this came into, why this was really important. Okay, oh, somebody mentioned about toe sleeves. Um, yes, if your toes rub together, and we'll talk about that, toe sleeves are perfect for that. Okay, any questions? Okay, so now let me share my screen. We'll go back to the presentation. Share. Okay, so we talked about this. Um, infection, um, we all know about infection. Um, the issue with antibiotic cream is you do not want to use so much that it softens the skin around the blister because then that makes it softer and more prone to other problems. So use just what you need and clearly check for um, signs of infection as you would for any wound. We talked about blister popping um, in terms of um, is that the to do it or not to do it? I'm not giving you a recommendation. I'm giving you the triage scenario so that you can decide what is best. Um, this is the basically the, the issue about serious infection when blood blisters are popped. Um, I've never had a blood blister issue on our hikes. This talks about how to pop a blister 
the best thing I have found is in my repair kit, I carry a sewing needle. I, you then you sterilize it. I prefer to sterilize it with a flame. You pop, you basically, you let gravity help you. You do not damage the hood of the blister. You put two like little holes in the bottom and let gravity drain it. Very simple. And all you're doing is, is cutting, basically puncturing the loose flap of skin on the top. It doesn't hurt at all. It sounds gross, but it doesn't hurt at all. Okay, bandaging your feet. This is the really hard part. Um, trying to do it well. Um, duct tape is really hard to do. The next care tape is easier. Um, I would suggest that you basically practice bandaging your own feet. It's easier to bandage somebody else's feet than your own feet. But the kind of bandage that you see here, or if you cut tape in this um, shape, is basically makes it much easier. We talked about these toe gel protectors and toe sleeves. Um, there are many different styles of these, but I would get them. I cut down the cardboard. I leave them in their protective coat case so that they stay clean. And then I just put them in my kit. So I have three different blister kits that I take with me. Um, I do long distance running. Um, so I've got just a few things, right? My little Q-tip with my next care, a couple waterproof band-aids and my blister pad. For day hikes, I carry a bit more. And then when I'm on a big hike, I have a much larger kit depending on the number of people I go and the conditions that I expect. Okay, now let's talk about um, multi-day hikes um, and a little bit more on socks. Um, as I said, I carry five to six pairs of socks and on the long runs, like four hours or more, my feet, as many adults do, after you're on your feet all day, they swell just slightly. That causes blisters because it changes the shape of your foot. I wear compression socks. Either typically the full sock, they now come in different compression levels, different colors. I hike with them in my backpacking boots. They feel fine, right? And I found that this has this alone on long runs or on many hikes has prevented a lot of my blisters. Now the 50 miler with um, my crew, we went to Desolation Wilderness. We stopped at a lake, the scouts were playing away and it was fine. And suddenly one of them said his feet hurt and he hadn't complained at all. And then we looked at his feet and there were these massive blisters filled with sand. And you can see here where it is this black ridge, his whole thing was filled with sand. And it's like, what are we gonna do? And he never complained. You know, we don't know to this day if he is just can't feel pain or he's just a really tough guy. Um, so this is Bob Wedig, for those of you who know Bob Wedig, trying, we, first of all, we tried to get rid of the sand out of the foot by pulling it out, right? Cutting the blister and, you know, getting it out. Clearly that did not work. We then, one of the people figured out, we're going to flush it out. What they did was they opened up the bottom of the blister. Well, they opened up both ends of the blister, got the cleanest water we could get through our filter and flushed it out. And it cleaned it miraculously. Um, why I carry the syringe now is that I can now do, if I ever had to do this again, I'd be able to do it without using somebody's water bottle. Um, this young man, is now studying to be a nurse. And he's fully aware that we are using <laughs> his feet for a case study. Um, 
so basically this doesn't show how bad it was, but then we had him air dry his feet for the rest of the day. Um, we then bandaged it up with gauze pads and duct tape. And he completed the rest of the 50 miler with no problem. Do you have to change the duct tape or once it's on, it goes on until it comes off? It varies by person. Um, it depends, like on my feet, it lasts for about 24 hours and then it just comes right off. So every day we checked his feet and every time it got loose, we replaced it. We put on new gauze pads um, and new duct tape. We had a question, do you double sock? That is a personal preference. I do not do that. Um, and I missed the, I didn't go through the one slide. Um, socks should be tight on your feet. Socks should not be loose. Loose socks slide around. Loose socks that are dirty, filled with salts from your sweat become like sandpaper. Um, so whether you have double socks or single socks, make sure that they are tight. And one of the things I made a big mistake on that Philmont trip was I brought my favorite socks, my well-worn socks that were loose. The Philmont Rangers, what they did was they were, these group of Rangers were all men. They bought women's socks because they're a little bit narrower and a little bit tighter. Um, so I would say for sock liners, you, you have to practice to see what works best. People swear by them and other people don't use them. Um, so what you really want to do is, you know, where you're going, understand who's got chronic blisters, who has um, occasional blisters, you know, what are the conditions that you expect to face. Just because you've never had blisters before doesn't mean you won't get them on a trip. Um, basically test out your gear, your feet with a full pack that's probably actually heavier than what you're going to um, carry because it changes the shape of your foot. Um, treat problems immediately, bring lots of extra supplies, and try out a few things, especially the bandaging. And teach your scouts about the above because they're the best ones to take care of their feet. Um, this is the book again that I, met, that I showed you. Um, this website is a woman in Australia. Um, she has a free subscription um, to her newsletter. Um, she also sells some products, but I found a lot on that site that was really helpful. And if you need to do more research, don't search backpacking and blisters. That is typically minimal. Search on the ultra marathoners the people who do 50 miles, 100 miles, um, like my neighbor does, they're the ones who have the worst blisters and have the best blogs on how to treat them. And to conclude, um, here's the URL again for to get this presentation. Um, it's in the chat, so you can copy it from there. And if you, then that's my email. So feel free to contact me if you have any questions. So what I will do now is stop sharing. Actually, I'll leave this up for a moment if you wanna copy anything. But now it's time to answer or to ask questions. There's one here that somebody put in. What about toes with misshaped nails? Oh, um, ooh, yes, I have this. Well, I didn't talk about that. I went over that slide. If you have misshaped nails, um, Pedicures work really well. Um, I mean, if you have misshaped toes, um, some kind of congenital issue, then I would use toe sleeves. If your nails are just um, something that are difficult for you to trim, I would go and get a pedicure. They even, they're male pedicures as well. Um, but the corners of the nails, you really want them rounded so that you don't have sharp corners. Um, if you, when you look at where your blisters are, if they're next to a sharp nail, you got a pretty good idea what the cause is. And I think you have to be careful at a pedicure that they don't take up too much of your callus too, right? Yes. Sometimes they just want to remove all the callus to soft feet and that's broken again then. 
Exactly. Um, so what I, before a trip, I would just say, I just want my toes done. You, you, you nailed it. Leave Somebody my, asked a question, would wool socks be better socks to wear at Philmont? Um, I found that wool socks, I had wool socks and then I have the um, polypropylene socks. I found that my feet sweated too much in wool socks. Um, there are a lot of blends now that you can then try the new hiking socks. Uh, REI has several different kinds. The ones I like best are the ones that are padded on the heels and near the underneath the ball of your foot, but around the foot itself, it's a little bit thinner. So you, where you don't need padding, where there's a little bit more airflow, so to speak, and you only have padding where you need it. Um, so um, wool, again, it's a, again, preference. Um, I, my, all of my socks are synthetic mixtures. My wool socks I wear for pleasure. Here's another question for people who know they get chronic blisters, should they apply moleskin or second skin preventively? Yes, um, moleskin, I mean, if you know where you're going to be getting the blisters, um, I would start probably with um, some kind of tape first. Um, and then apply the second skin others if you need it. But yes, people like the ultra marathoners tape their feet before they go and do a long run. Do you also find that, um, I know for me, a lot of times I think I'm doing fine until I have a really big uphill and then my heels get it. And then as I have a really long downhill, it's my front of my toes getting it. So will you stop throughout and kind of tend to hot spots instead of wait until the end of the day, the minute you feel the hot spot, stop, uh, tend to it, and then go on. Yes, and then that immediately, then you know that especially like on the downhill, your feet are sliding forward into your boot, right? And that's so you're pressing your toes against the front of the boot. And so what happens is, especially your big toe, and it drives the nail back into the, the toe and you get the the, the black toes that are most common, um, the runner's toes. So what you typically need to do there is you might need larger boots, you might need to tighten your boots, or maybe more padding, you know, socks with more padding in the toes. Um, what they found when I had blisters, I took my running boots, no, I took my hiking boots actually to the running store. I go to this great running store in Campbell and they said my toe box was too narrow so my toes were cramped up like this. And I went back to REI and I said, I want the boots with the wider toe box that spread my toes apart a little bit. And I got rid of a lot of the blisters that were between my toes. Um, the heels going uphill, that's a harder problem to solve that you're probably gonna solve with tape. Because even if you tighten up your um, boots, your heel is still going back when you're going uphill. And here's a good, somebody suggested before we start any hike, we ask all our scouts to untie and retie their boots more tightly. That's a good one, yes. Oh, for scouts in their boots, um, you really need to check that the scouts haven't outgrown their boots. The big problem we had was that you want them to buy the boots soon enough before the hike to break them in, but not so soon that their feet grow. We've had scouts outgrow their boots before they wear them, or the parents said, I just bought you boots. I'm not gonna buy you another pair of boots. And then they go on the hike and the boots are too small. So, I think also if they've used somebody's hand-me-downs, the insides have been formed to somebody else's foot and they don't fit right too. That can be a problem. Um, my sons did share their boots um, when possible, and now I've also worn my son's boots because they've outgrown me. Um, but yes, the boots are a little bit better now, but yeah, that can clearly be a, a problem if the boots don't fit the foot, especially the width. Um, so, you know, if it's an overnight hike and you're just like going to Castle Rock or something, it's probably not a problem. It's just on these really long hikes. Somebody also just said, it was also taught to stop the hike 
about 10 minutes into it for a boot check, just to make sure if anybody has to adjust. Okay, that's good. And, and then another one uh, question, any recommendations on properly breaking in a pair of new boots? Um, they break in a whole lot faster now than they used to. Um, the boots that I got in the last two years, I can break in in about 20 miles versus the ones that I got like maybe 25 years ago. Um, I typically just start, when I get a new boot, I just, first of all, start wearing it around, you know, local walks when I'm walking my dog. And then I just then advance from there, right? Do the local flat walks, then go to maybe Rancho, do some more hikes there, break that in, put on a pack, wear that. Sometimes I've even worn the pack in the neighborhood just doing laps around the block if I couldn't go. Um, but you wanna break it in, if you think about it from your own body weight on the flat, your body weight on hills, and then a lightweight pack on hills, and then if you can't overload your pack. So, cause it will do is it'll flatten your foot. Um, and then also if you tend to run to plantar fasciitis, it will point it out then. Somebody noted that REI takes back boots in the first year. I don't know if that's if you've really used them, but I don't know. Yeah, I have heard that I've never done it because typically I've worn them enough that I feel too guilty taking them back. Any other questions? I was wondering when you wear your regular uh, hiking shoes when crossing the streams, don't they get heavy? So when you are done with crossing the water body, it's so heavy to walk in those. So do you swap for a different shoe? No, I don't carry a second boot. You just shake them out. Maybe, you know, if we really got them soaking wet, we're gonna pour out the water, change our socks. But most times you just keep going. I mean, our packs at Philmont, because all of the crew gear and the food, my pack was pushing 45 pounds. For me, that's a huge amount. So my boots are a couple pounds. So there would be no way I could carry a second pair of boots. Okay, um, and you don't even recommend, actually it's dangerous to go without shoes and water because you may get cut or bleeds from the rocks, right? Exactly, and the ground is uneven and you really wanna prevent from falling. Um, so yeah, we just left our boots on all the time. And also reiterating, I think you said pop the blister. If the blister is ready to be popped, pop it in a clean environment rather than waiting for it to be popped at an unexpected time when it's, or the other way. Well, let's put this way. If you are on an overnight hike and you're gonna be home soon, don't pop it. Put your moleskin on in the donut and wait, wait till you get home where it's nice and clean. If you're on like Philmont and it's early on and you know that it's probably gonna, you can't protect it enough because of just the conditions and what you're doing. And you know you're gonna be in a dirty environment and it's gonna pop and you can't take care of it right away. Then yeah, I would pop it. I would drain it. Let's call it draining it. Draining it, bandaging it well, keeping it with waterproof bandaging on and so that during your dirty active day, you don't get it contaminated and get it infected. Um, but you just have to decide. And if let's say you decide, no, I think I can go without popping it and it pops on you, then what you wanna do is stop as soon as you can and then treat it like an open wound. You know, disinfect it, clean it, bandage it appropriately. Thank you. Um, the other thing that I was wanting to comment about popping a blister is that when you do pop it, what you're just doing is putting a pinhole in and draining it so that that bubble on top, that piece of skin stays nicely intact. When it tends to pop on its own, it tends to shred. And then you have this big open red sore, which is much harder to take care of, right? Um, so that's your trade-off. And, um, but I mean, let's put it this way, as long as you, you're gonna clean things up quickly and put an antibiotic ointment on it carefully and keep it clean, 
you know, if you make a mistake in your decision process, you can correct it quickly. This is not a life or death thing, right? Because you've always got um, stuff to take care of wounds when you're, you know, with your scouts. Okay. Well, if there, if you think of another question, just send me an email. Um, and I want to thank you for coming. I hope this was, um, you know, good and helpful to you and that you learned something and that you can um, help your scouts in the future so that when you go to Philmont or on a backpacking trip or running or something, you will have a more enjoyable experience. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Good night. Good night.